six weeks away from winter, and in some parts of the country, the snow has already arrived. A blizzard blanketing parts of big sky country with a foot of snow. Meanwhile, President-elect Biden referenced the pandemic today, saying, quote, we're still facing a very dark winter. A shot of optimism today with a potential vaccine breakthrough as the U.S. reports more than 100,000 new COVID cases for the fifth day in a row. Pfizer claims its human trials have been 90% effective at fighting the coronavirus. What's next for the drug maker in the approval process and when Americans can expect widespread distribution? The Biden transition begins. The president-elect unveils his coronavirus task force, urging everyone to wear a mask until a vaccine is available. Global leaders call to congratulate him and the ambitious first day in office already being planned. No signs of conceding. President Trump refuses to accept the outcome of the election, making more claims about election fraud today without providing any evidence. Republican leaders carefully walking the line, echoing Trump's call for, quote, legal votes to be counted. This is the president fires his defense secretary in a tweet and more White House staffers test positive for COVID. And with Georgia on many minds, specifically the Senate races, we'll talk with one of two Democrats hoping to change the makeup of Congress in time for the Biden administration. Millions of Americans' health care now hangs in the balance as the Supreme Court gets set to rule on the fate of the Affordable Care Act. We'll take a closer look at what's at stake and the potential future for Obamacare. And the making of a moment. While I may be the first woman in this office, I will not be the last. Tonight, we reflect on Kamala Harris's barrier-breaking rise. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Well, it appears the third time is indeed the charm for the scrappy kid from Scranton who grew up with a stutter and ran for president three times. He's now poised to become the 46th president of the United States. Meanwhile, President Trump is not yet conceding. What he is doing is mounting potential legal challenges. But the new president-elect is already hitting the ground running. And in an address to Americans today, he made it clear that his top priority is the pandemic. He warned again that we're facing a, quote, dark winter and urged Americans to wear masks to slow the spread as the U.S. hits 10 million cases with at least 237,860 Americans losing their lives to coronavirus. That toll comes as we have significant news in the race for a vaccine. The company Pfizer is reporting promising results from their vaccine trials, which appear to be more than 90% effective in preventing the disease. We'll have much more on the vaccine in just a moment. But first, we start off with ABC's Mary Bruce covering the transition of President-elect Joe Biden. President-elect Joe Biden making it clear the work begins today with the pandemic his first order of business. Applauding the vaccine breakthrough, but warning COVID's worst wave is yet to come. There's a need for bold action to fight this pandemic. We're still facing a very dark winter. Biden today briefed by his new coronavirus task force, led by former Obama Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, David Kessler, who ran the FDA under George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton, and Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, a professor of public health at Yale. We'll follow the science. We'll follow the science. Let me say that again. And we'll adjust to new data when it comes in. And we'll listen and work in cooperation with governors and local leaders of both parties. He also implored every American to do their part. It doesn't matter who you voted for, whether you stood, who, where you stood before Election Day. It doesn't matter your party, your point of view. We can save tens of thousands of lives if everyone would just wear a mask for the next few months. Not Democrat or Republican lives, American lives. Biden returning to the central theme of his campaign, unity, a message he emphasized the night he won. For all those of you who voted for President Trump, I understand the disappointment tonight. I've lost a couple times myself, but now let's give each other a chance. It's time to put away the harsh rhetoric, lower the temperature, see each other again, listen to each other again. The new team, a sign of change in America. While I may be the first woman in this office, I will not be the last. Because every little girl watching tonight sees that this 
is a country of possibilities. World leaders today coming forward to embrace the new administration. From close allies of President Trump, like the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia and the UK's Boris Johnson. I really congratulate uh, uh, President-elect Biden and, uh, and, and Kamala Harris. To the mayor of Paris, who tweeted, welcome back, America. And Canada's Justin Trudeau, who spoke with Biden today and tweeted, we've worked with each other before and we're ready to pick up on that work and tackle the challenges and opportunities facing our two countries. Multiple global leaders offering their congratulations. Mary Bruce joins us now. Mary, just give us a sense of the timeline of what comes next in this transition process and what the president-elect will be focusing on, especially in the coming days ahead. Well, it is clear that he wants to project leadership and the fact that he is getting essentially to work, even though he's not officially the president just yet. He is focusing, we know, on these four big priorities, the pandemic, the economy, racial injustice, and climate change. But he, before he can get to really doing the hard work, he needs a team in place. So over the coming days and weeks, while he is focused on the coronavirus and all of his agenda, getting that together, he also needs to hire his White House staff, his chief of staff, first and foremost. Then the rest of the White House staff. They refer to them as their day one staff. And then further down the road, of course, he has to pick his cabinet secretaries. So it's a lot of just getting the team together and then focusing on how to make all of those campaign promises into reality. And meanwhile, this is all, of course, happening as President Trump has yet to concede the race, doubling down, in fact, on his claims of voter fraud without providing any evidence. How's the Biden campaign responding to this? Are they simply moving forward regardless of what the president does? Uh, that's exactly right. They are forging ahead. Look, they are confident that they have won the White House. They will be the next president and vice president, and they have their own massive legal team. They say, look, any of the president's legal challenges, they are confident that they will be able to tackle and face. So, Yes, they, they are focused on, on anything that the president may throw at their, their way, but they say that they will be able to deal with that while also clearly just getting to work and focusing on what's to come. Mary Bruce, thank you so much. Thanks, Lindsay. The lack of cooperation so far between the Biden and Trump teams is coming on the same day as that blockbuster news on the vaccine front. Drug maker Pfizer has announced that its vaccine candidate for coronavirus is 90 percent effective in fighting the virus. Dr. Fauci called the test results extraordinary. This is the U.S. now tops 10 million COVID-19 cases with rising infections in 49 states, every single state with the exception of Hawaii. Pfizer did not take U.S. federal money to develop this vaccine. ABC Steve Steve Osinsami has all the details. It's what the world has been waiting for. American drug maker Pfizer and a German partner say they could be the first to produce a safe and effective vaccine for the coronavirus. And when they look at patients who they've tested so far, they say the drug already appears to be about 90 percent effective. Indeed, the vaccine was uh, proven to be very efficacious, uh, overwhelmingly. And uh, that was uh, big news for me as well. Not very many people expected it would be as high as that. A 90% efficacy just is extraordinary. Patients need two doses. And if the vaccine is approved by the end of the year, Pfizer expects to produce enough vaccine to cover about 25 million people. But that appears to be for people around the world and not just the U.S. And once it's shown to be safe and effective, the first people who will likely get the vaccine here are health care providers and groups like seniors who are most at risk. Dr. Victoria Smith is one of the heroes who agreed to join the human trials and says she is happy to help bring an end to the pandemic. As an African-American female, um, knowing that this this uh, disease was affecting African-Americans and people of color disproportionately, I also wanted to be part of uh, the race to a cure, not so much a cure, but something that could help uh, prevent uh, COVID-19. Getting the vaccine to Americans won't be easy. It has to be stored and shipped in freezers that can keep the medicine unbelievably cold, around 94 degrees below zero. These are Pfizer's freezers in Kalamazoo, Michigan. UPS says it's building freezer farms, and FedEx is adding freezers and refrigerated trucks. The president and his supporters are questioning the timing of the news here, which they believe is no accident that it's after the election. But Pfizer's CEO says they weren't holding out and he only learned of this on Sunday and says, in fact, his company did not take public dollars for their research so they wouldn't have to worry about government interference. I wanted to liberate our scientists from any bureaucracy that could come. 
by accepting uh, money. Pfizer is now planning to ask the FDA for emergency use authorization of the drug as soon as next week when they expect safety data to be ready. Other drug makers are not far behind. Moderna is producing a similar vaccine. Both use genetic instructions that tell the body to produce a protein that triggers you into fighting the virus. Some promising news there indeed. And for more now, let's bring in our Steve Osin Now, Pfizer could ask for that emergency use authorization as early as next week. What are the next steps? Well, Pfizer could get an answer back from the government as early as December. And they're telling us that if they get a yes, they already have a stockpile of this medicine ready to go. How much? They're not saying, but they have enough to get the wheels rolling. Lindsay? And you report as well that some high-risk people could get the vaccine by the end of the year. But what do we know about the timing for more widespread distribution? Well, they're telling us that it's looking, the government is saying it's looking more like the middle of next year, possibly the summer, before there is widespread distribution of this medicine. But, you know, there are other manufacturers who are coming online with a vaccine that might be safe and effective, and that could accelerate this. Lindsay? Steve Osin saw me for us in Atlanta. Thanks so much, Steve. And for more on this potential vaccine breakthrough and how the presidential transition could impact its rollout, we bring in Tom Bossard, President Trump's former Homeland Security Advisor and ABC contributor. Thanks so much for joining us, Tom. Let's start out with today's promising vaccine news. How much of a game changer could this really be, keeping in mind that this potential treatment will not be rolled out widely in time to help control the surge in cases that may grow worse in the coming weeks? Yeah, well, it depends on how long of a game you're playing. And for me, I, I feel as if this is only great news because it changes our expectations. Of course, it's, it's good to celebrate those things, but we are in the middle of a shorter game right now that is tragic. The numbers have now taken a, a kind of a foothold that suggests that shift into exponential growth. We haven't talked about that since the early, you know, March, February timeframe when this was first, first, you know, taking hold in New York. And what we're seeing now is it taking hold in 36 New York, so to speak. Multiple places around this country, more than half the states, are seeing a, a kind of a, of a threshold where they're about to head into massive exponential or geometric growth uh, in cases and deaths and hospitalizations. And this vaccine, while very promising, is just simply not going to be in time. I imagine that a massive vaccine rollout is difficult in the best of circumstances, but with a presidential transition underway and Trump's refusal to concede the election for now, what extra challenges do you envision and what advice would you give to both Trump and separately to Biden? Yeah, so there's really a number of things happening here. Uh, I'd like to see a smoother transition. There's quite a bit that goes into taking over the reins of the largest, most complex organization in the world. And although Vice President and now President-elect Biden has quite a bit of experience, uh, his team needs kind of the keys and the access here pretty soon. And not just because it's a smooth transition that I seek, it's really because we're in the middle of this crisis. So what would I tell them? Well, I would tell them both something very similar. But I would say before you worry about logistics and concessions and all the things that I'm not going to be able to influence uh, President Trump's thinking on, I'd urge them to at least come to terms with their widely diverging view of how to respond to this pandemic. You see, in 75 days, it won't be President Trump's responsibility anymore. It will be President-elect Biden's. But all of those governors that are going to be in office for two or four more years are going to be presiding over a whole lot of sickness and a whole lot of suffering and a whole lot of economic loss if they don't take an action now geared towards mitigation and suppression instead of what we're doing which is to currently let it let it kind of let it let it spread and wait for the pharmaceutical interventions we're going to we're going to really regret it and so what I'd like them to do is come together with a common objective they don't have to agree to who's president but they should agree to a common objective and more broadly, Biden will take office in the midst of multiple crises, a health crisis, an economic crisis, political division, and social unrest. How important is it that we see a smooth transition of power and cooperation between both teams? Yeah, you know, ultimately, that's going to be a, a, a must, if you will. So how important is it? Very important. Uh, for right now, I'm not happy with what I'm seeing but I'm not worried about the levers of power and about government stability and about our station in the world. If this continues, though, 
too far into this 75 days, it's really destructive. We've seen later transitions, shorter transitions, but we really don't want to tempt fate right now because of this crisis. And I'll tell you, my answer will change if President Trump and Vice President-elect Biden can't come to terms with needing to be on the same page. If they don't get the same objective lined up that we need a pretty massive and immediate suppression effort, then we're going to have to urge a faster transition than President Trump is clearly willing to orchestrate right now. Tom Bossert, our thanks to you. President Trump may have only 72 days left in office, but he's still shaking up his staff. Today, he fired Defense Secretary Mark Esper in a tweet. Esper had broken with the president over the use of active duty troops to battle protesters this summer. Meanwhile, most Republicans are staying on the sidelines as President Trump challenges the election results, despite the president's campaign providing no evidence to back up claims of voter fraud. So what's the president's next move? Here's ABC's chief White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl. The only glimpses we've seen of Donald Trump since Joe Biden was projected president-elect came over the weekend at his golf course. He is still not willing to accept defeat, fighting his battle in court and on Twitter. But today he also announced on Twitter he had terminated his defense secretary, Mark Esper. Esper was with the president during the infamous photo op at St. John's Church where protesters were cleared out with tear gas and flashbang grenades. He then infuriated the president by suggesting he would object to an order to deploy the military to crack down on protesters. Mark Jesper? Did you call him Jesper? Oh, okay. Some people call him Jesper. Esper hated the idea he was seen as a yes man, telling the Military Times in an interview published just after he was fired, who's pushed back more than anybody? Name another cabinet secretary that's pushed back. Have you seen me on stage saying, under the exceptional leadership of blah, 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 we have blah, 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 blah. It comes as Team Trump is challenging the election Hello, results everyone. in several states. This election is not over. Far from it. But they've presented no credible evidence of vote fraud. As the Republican lieutenant governor of Georgia told CNN today. We've not had any sort of credible uh, incidents raised to our level yet. Most Republicans in Congress are staying on the sidelines, not yet acknowledging that Joe Biden won, but also not repeating the president's false allegations. The president has every right to look into allegations and to request recounts under the law. On Twitter, Vice President Pence proclaimed, it ain't over till it's over. But notably, even he did not repeat the president's claims of voter fraud. One prominent Republican who says it actually is over, former President George W. Bush. He called to congratulate both President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, saying, quote, Though we have political differences, I know Joe Biden to be a good man who has won his opportunity to lead and unify our country. Some bipartisan praise of Biden. Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, the president and his team have yet to provide any concrete evidence of fraud, much less enough fraud to change the election's outcome. So what are you hearing on the president's thinking right now? What's the end game here if these legal challenges don't go anywhere? Well, first, uh, I think he is absolutely determined to pursue every possible legal challenge uh, to try to overturn what are still unofficial uh, election results. Uh, I don't see any prospect that that is in any way feasible, but his team will pursue challenges in several states. And then I think the end game here is that at some point you reach a point where the courts have said, that's it. Uh, you know, we, they've knocked down all the challenges. And of course, there are a series of deadlines uh, between now and, and January for the selection of the Electoral College and for the Electoral College to vote. And, and eventually, the president will have to accept the results. And I don't think there's any question, at least based on what I've heard from people close to him, that ultimately, he will accept the results in terms of, you know, he won't, like, refuse to re leave the White House, uh, but he is never going to acknowledge uh, that he lost this election fair and square. He will never, ever acknowledge that. So we also have word of more COVID cases inside the president's circle. Give us a sense of who we know has now tested positive. 
Well, as, as you remember, we heard uh, uh, late late in the week uh, last week that Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, uh, uh, is, uh, is tested positive. Uh, we've also heard today Ben Carson, the secretary of of, of health and, and I mean sorry of housing and urban development, and also uh, we have the latest news, David Bossy, uh, who is was just appointed to be the head of the president's legal team, the person charged with leading the legal cases uh, I, I, in all of these states. He is now a uh, COVID positive as well. So uh, we still have, you know, some of the most uh, persistent COVID outbreaks in the country have been right here uh, at the White House or uh, on the president's team. Of course, hundreds of people gathered there at the White House on election night to, to watch the returns yep. come in. Jonathan Carl, thanks so much as always. Thanks, Lindsay. The news today of a potentially highly effective COVID-19 vaccine from Pfizer sent the Dow Jones and S&P soaring. The Dow ended the day up nearly 3%, 834 points higher, with hard-hit retail and travel stocks among those that surged. Meanwhile, tech stocks like Amazon, Netflix, and Zoom that have become known as the stay-at-home stocks during the pandemic fell. That led to the tech-heavy Nasdaq ending the day down 181 points. When we come back, the tropical storm lashing South Florida with more than half of the more than a foot and a half of rain where it'll go next the looming court battle the supreme court set to take up the affordable care act will look at the stakes for families but up next the balance of power in the senate is on the line in georgia and it could have profound implications for a biden presidency up next we'll speak with one of the two democrats vying to flip georgia completely blue stories of our time anytime nightline your mom said comb your hair your dad told you smarten up your dog is judging you right now and your best friend just called you crazy we all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight now imagine getting your news like that no bull no spin just give it to me straight straightforward news straight to the heart of the story abc news straightforward the americans here on the ground and the iraq 18,000 tons Matatas. ismail yes. david david over ground zero from hurricane michael you can see just home after home david it's a major this was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for the thing. Tomorrow morning, on the day before the CMA Awards, wake up from Nashville with... Hey, I'm Darius Rucker. Good morning, America. Yes, it's Darius performing for you. This is going to be so good. Tomorrow, only on Good Morning America, sponsored by Walmart. The night before the CMA Awards. Finish the sentence. Country music in 2020 is... Alive and well. Creative. Resilient. Raw. Emotional. Oh, yeah. The ABC special with Robin Roberts, Tuesday night on ABC. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Welcome back. While we do know presidents-elect Biden will take the oath of office on January 20th, we do not yet know whether it will be a divided Congress or a narrow Democratic majority. Right now in the Senate, Democrats have won 48 seats, Republicans 48 as well. Let's bring you up to speed on the Senate races still outstanding. In North Carolina, Republican Senator Tom Tillis leads by nearly 96,000 votes. There's still as many as 171,000 votes still left to count. In Alaska, Republican Dan Sullivan leads by nearly 58,000 thousand votes, but not a single absentee ballot has been counted yet. Officials do not start counting there until tomorrow. Regardless of what happens with those two seats, the eyes of the nation will no doubt be on Georgia. Both the race between GOP Senator Kelly Leffler and Pastor Raphael Warnock and the race between Senator David Perdue and his Democratic challenger John Ossoff are headed to a January 5th runoff. If the Democrats win both seats, they will then take control of the Senate.
John Ossoff joins us now. Thank you so much for your time. Now, Georgia may be on the verge of turning blue for the first time in a presidential race since 1992 with Bill Clinton. Currently, Joe Biden is up by more than 10,000 votes. That race appears to be headed for a recount. But you receive roughly 100,000 votes less than Biden. So in your mind, how does this race change in January when there is no presidential ticket on the ballot? How do you get those 100,000 voters to put a check next to your name? And also, how do you get voters to turn out again when the White House isn't on the line. Well, that doesn't worry me at all, Lindsay, and thank you so much for having me. But first of all, there is no enthusiasm in Georgia, even among Republican voters, for incumbent Senators David Perdue or Kelly Leffler. These are two of the most notoriously corrupt, self-dealing politicians in America. And those who came out and voted for him weren't motivated because they support Leffler and Perdue. They were voting in the presidential race. Meanwhile, Georgia Democrats have tremendous momentum. We're invigorated by our success here. This has been a 10-year effort to register voters, organize, train volunteers as a state becomes younger and more diverse. And we're ready to proceed and win these runoff elections to ensure that we can get out of this crisis, control this pandemic, and pass economic relief for working families and small businesses. But if I can just push back for a moment, because Purdue did receive 90,000 more votes than you did last week. So what will change in January? And how will you try to convince Republicans who may be on the fence to give you a chance instead of having potentially checks and balances in place on the Biden pre presidency? Because there may have been voters, Lindsay, coming out to vote to reelect Donald Trump. Those voters aren't coming out to vote to reelect David Perdue. David Perdue, who had more money spent on his behalf by national Republicans than I think any incumbent Republican senator, failed to secure a majority of support. He was considered a lock to cruise easily to reelection eight months ago. But his personal misconduct, his persistent lying to the people on the COVID 19 pandemic, his refusal even to debate me in public to hold town hall meetings, to answer basic questions about his record, uh, put him in an extraordinarily weak position heading into this runoff. Meanwhile, Georgia Democrats, as I said, have tremendous momentum. And let's not lose sight of the stakes. We're still in the midst of a health crisis. We're still in the midst of an economic crisis. That's what Georgia voters are focused on. And in order for us to get out of this crisis, we need to be able to govern. And that means we need to win these two elections. Now, the president still not accepting the election results yet. What, if any, impact do you think that that could have on your race? Well, I think that Senator Perdue is going to need to make a decision pretty quickly. Is he going to continue to indulge this temper tantrum that the president's throwing uh, and go down with the ship? Or is he going to assert any measure of independence? He's failed for the last four years to show any spine to ever break with this president. He's sold out our state and our values with his loyalty to Donald Trump. And it appears now he may still lack the courage to say anything crosswise of the president. In 2016, 22% of eligible voters in Georgia were not registered to vote. This year, that number decreased to just 2%. Many credit the work of Stacey Abrams. In your eyes, is that increase in registration what appears to have turned your state blue? And, and what role do you see organizations like hers playing ahead of January? Well, Stacey is incredible and brilliant, and she's done brilliant work here in Georgia for the last decade. And what we're seeing is several different things unfolding at the same time. A state becoming younger and more diverse and more dynamic every day. Plus the investment in infrastructure, organizing and registration led by folks like Stacy, and these highly competitive elections that we've had for the last several years to build infrastructure. All of that during a time of political awakening and political realignment. The Trump presidency shook many people out of their slumber and into civic engagement. And most of all, this pandemic brought home what the human consequences are when we have leaders who are incompetent at governing and fundamentally dishonest with the American people during a crisis. And what we need to do now is eject those leaders who have badly misled us, who have denied and downplayed the scope of the threat to our health, who have failed to deliver the kind of economic relief that we need. And we need to pass substantial measures to jumpstart this economy help working families and small businesses that are struggling, empower the CDC, for example, based here in Georgia, and public health experts and doctors across the country to fight this pandemic. Now, three years ago, you ran for the House and lost. It was the first House seat up for grabs after the 2016 election and gained national attention with millions of dollars flowing in. How do you balance nationalizing the runoff and the benefits that would bring versus the criticism that comes with that? Your opponent's campaign has already said that a vote for you is a vote to hand power to Chuck Schumer and the radical Democrats. 
Yeah, you're going to hear all those typical nationalized arguments. I mean, look, it is inevitable that this race becomes nationalized to an extent because there are national implications. What I'm doing is staying focused on the stakes, and the stakes are both national and local. Here are the stakes. There are hundreds of thousands of American lives that still hang in the balance if we fail to properly respond to this pandemic. The Biden administration can't do it alone. The president-elect will need Congress to respond to this pandemic. The president-elect will need Congress to pass substantial economic relief that rushes help to struggling families and businesses, that invests in infrastructure to create jobs and get this economy moving again. And millions of jobs and livelihoods, foreclosures, evictions are all on the line. That's what this is about. Will we take the steps necessary to recover from COVID-19 and invest in economic recovery? Or will we be mired in partisan gridlock at the hands of the very people whose personal ethical failures and lack of policy vision made this crisis so much worse and have left us in this mess? I want to just get your response on Senators Perdue and Leffler, who are out now with a statement this afternoon calling for the Republican Secretary of State to resign, citing his mismanagement and lack of transparency. I should note there are no credible reports of fraud in Georgia and no outstanding lawsuits. How would you rate his job performance? Well, I think that Georgia election officials over the last 10 years have faced warranted criticism for voter suppression. And the work of people like Stacey Abrams has secured ballot access for hundreds of thousands of Georgians who might otherwise have been able to participate in elections. And Stacey Abrams deserves the lion's share of the credit for enhancing access to the franchise and defending the sacred right to vote here in Georgia. And that work continues. And our work to protect voting rights and defend voting rights will continue through January. And, and lastly, John, this is just really an aside. Uh, many people have been crediting the legacy uh, of John Lewis. Is, is that him in the picture right over your shoulder, kind of serving as a bridge? Yes, it is. And my, my first ever exposure to public service or experience around politics was working as a very, very young man for Congressman Lewis. Uh, and he was my mentor for 17 years and had a profound influence on my worldview, uh, my conviction that it's about making sure every family can access the basics, affordable housing, affordable health care, dignified work that pays a living wage, voting rights and equal justice. And, and this image depicts him bridging the chasm with his body so that people can access the ballot box. And that's, of course, about his leadership across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, 55 years ago, and also about his enduring legacy, helping to secure voting rights for more and more Americans, a struggle that continues to this day. And I'll just close with this, Lindsay, and thank you again for having me. If we're going to pass a new Voting Rights Act, if we're going to expand voting rights for all eligible voters in this country, we need to be able to do that in the United States Senate. We need to win these elections. John Ossoff, we thank you so much for your time. Hope you'll come back on the show before the election. Thank you so much. Still ahead here on Prime, the tributes continue to pour in for Alex Trebek after his valiant fight. The growing conflict, the tensions between Armenia and Azerbaijan grow worse with the capture of a key town. But up next, with President-elect Biden setting up his transition, we take a look at what that entails by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Major news, there is a new first dog heading to Washington. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. You trust him. I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. 
No bull, no spin. Now imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. Another week in America, a country facing a new test now. The Wuhan airport, almost no one here. A last flight out of Rome. This is the nursing home just outside Seattle. Dozens of people were just rushed off this cruise ship. This is ground zero. It is shut down. Another ambulance just pulled out. Now they're headed to the hospital. Time is of the essence. You can see the ship behind me. The first time tests have been done here. Morning, afternoon, evening, late night. 24-7. ABC News. There for you. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Welcome back, everybody. We turn now to the transfer of power from the Trump administration to the incoming Biden administration in just a few short months. Presidential transitions are always an enormous undertaking, even without the health crisis, economic crisis, and political divisions that we see today. Here's a look by the numbers. In just 72 days, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will become president and vice president, respectively. They'll want to fill an estimated 4,000 political jobs as quickly as possible, including 1,250 positions that require Senate confirmation. The Biden administration will also oversee 2 million civilian federal workers and another 2 million active duty and reserve military troops. Another huge job will be to prepare a $4.7 trillion budget. Certainly a lot to get done in just a few months, but since Trump's General Services Administration has yet to declare Biden the apparent winner, it has not released the $9.9 .9 million in taxpayer funds meant for this transition. And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime. The bleak images coming out of Italy. Hospitals running out of beds. COVID patients waiting in their vehicles for oxygen. The Supreme Court set to decide the fate of the Affordable Care Act. We'll take a deep dive into the argument that they'll hear. And if you suffer from debilitating nightmares, you will want to keep watching. Relief could be on the way. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So this is the fourth weekend of protest. <laughs> Watch ABC News on location for Facebook Watch. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matata. Ismail. Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you very much. Thank you. says the vaccine was at least 90% effective according to an early analysis, but more safety data is needed before the company asks the FDA for authorization. We feel very good about the safe. 
Pfizer could ask the FDA for a narrow authorization later this month. If authorized, a limited supply of doses could be available for healthcare workers in high-risk populations in a matter of months and the general population by late summer 2021. HUD Secretary and Coronavirus Task Force member Dr. Ben Carson, among the latest in the president's orbit to test positive for the coronavirus. Carson and White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, who's also fighting the virus, both attended Trump's election night watch party at the White House. And just this afternoon, ABC News confirmed David Bossy, an outside advisor leading the Trump campaign's legal challenges, also now has the virus. President-elect Joe Biden hitting the ground running, even before being sworn into the job. Just two days after his historic win, Biden revealing his strategy to turn around the impacts of the coronavirus pandemic. We'll follow the science. We'll follow the science. Let me say that again. We can rebuild our economy back better than it was before. President-elect Joe Biden making his first announcement on the Biden-Harris Coronavirus Task Force. Biden saying that while word of the drug company Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine is excellent news, he still is urging patience. It doesn't matter your party, your point of view. We could save tens of thousands of lives if everyone would just wear a mask for the next few months. Meantime, President Trump is still defiant over the election results, tweeting today he had fired Secretary of Defense Mark Esper. One of the Trump campaign's legal challenges will get a hearing. Pennsylvania's Supreme Court will hear arguments in the city of Philadelphia's appeal against the Trump campaign's complaints that election officials blocked them from closely observing the vote count. This election is not over. Far from it. We have only begun the process of obtaining an accurate, honest vote count. A soaker in South Florida. Tropical Storm Ada flooding Broward and Dade counties. Rain totals northwest of Miami between 16 and 18 inches. The storm now headed out to the Gulf of Mexico and expected to impact the Florida panhandle later this week, but as a much weaker storm. Major news in the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan over the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh. Russia's President Vladimir Putin has announced the two have agreed to end the war and that Russian peacekeepers will be deployed. Armenia's Prime Minister said he'd signed a painful agreement to stop the war following major Azerbaijani advances. It has triggered riots in Armenia's capital over what protesters see as a surrender. The two sides have agreed to halt at their current positions, which leads leaves Azerbaijan in control of parts of Nagorno-Karabakh. Here is the hope of Jeopardy, Alex Trebek. No word yet on funeral arrangements or a memorial for Alex Trebek. Longtime host of Jeopardy died from pancreatic cancer at his home in Los Angeles Sunday. Trebek was 80. So many loved ones now sharing their memories. Jeopardy legend Ken Jennings writing, he was a lovely and deeply decent man. Actress Ruta Lee expressing the same and saying Trebek was still upbeat when they last spoke on Friday. It was a wonderful conversation. It was filled with humor. And former game show host Peter Marshall sharing their parting words. I knew that he wasn't doing very well, but I, I didn't know that it was so eminent. I said, just remember, I love you. And he said, I love you too, Petey. There's new hope for people struggling with debilitating nightmares. The FDA has approved the sale of Nightwear, a prescription-only Apple Watch app designed to treat nightmares related to disorders like PTSD. We now turn our attention to the COVID crisis overseas, where the country of Italy, which was battered by COVID earlier this year, is seeing cases rise by the tens of thousands. Medical professionals are already sounding the alarm for stricter guidelines as the head of the World Health Organization gave a sobering reality check for what could come next. Our Ian panel has the latest. Tonight, bleak images out of Italy as some hospitals run out of beds. In Naples, COVID-19 patients waiting outside in their vehicles, some needing oxygen to help them breathe while they wait. And now local media reporting even the oxygen tanks are in short supply. The country hitting a new daily record. Nearly 40,000 new coronavirus cases reported over the weekend. And these shocking scenes of patients in Turin in the north lying in corridors, some needing ventilators, were released by Italian newspaper La Stampa last week. The hospital there saying simply there isn't room. Throughout Europe, amid the deadly surge, fresh lockdowns. As the WHO warns the virus is going nowhere as winter sets in. 
Today, Portugal and Hungary joined other European nations in announcing new restrictions. But we also saw some small glimmers of hope from France, Belgium and elsewhere that the lockdown measures put in place weeks ago might be starting to work, with the first tentative signs that perhaps the second wave is levelling off in some countries. But still, for millions here in Europe, a vaccine can't come soon enough. Lindsay? Ian, thank you. And back here in the U.S., even as Joe Biden moves toward taking over the White House in January, tomorrow, President Trump and 18 Republican-led states will ask the Supreme Court to strike down Obamacare in its entirety, potentially jeopardizing the signature policy passed while Biden was vice president. The case comes in the middle of a raging pandemic and without any clear alternative to the health care law. And the court's decision in the coming weeks will impact virtually every American in some way. So tonight, ABC's Devin Dwyer takes a look at the stakes for families and how they're facing uncertainty over the law's future. For the third time in a decade, the Affordable Care Act is on the line at the Supreme Court. It's done me a lot of good, and, and honestly, I wouldn't have known where to turn um, or where to sign up for insurance. Veronica Valdez, a 38-year-old mother of five, is watching the case closely. After losing her job and employer-based health insurance in the recession, she found a safety net in Obamacare. That's the most important thing, you know, is making sure we're all healthy. And you never know, having kids also, I mean, you can't take the risk of not having insurance. Because she's unemployed, Valdez qualified for premium subsidies under the law, paying just $146 a month for coverage for her family. But now those subsidies, which help nearly 10 million Americans afford health care, could abruptly go away as President Trump and 18 Republican-led states ask the justices to invalidate the entire law. Normally, the Supreme Court, when they rule something unconstitutional, uh, it takes effect immediately. But it, it's really hard to find a precedent of a Supreme Court decision that would have such a sweeping effect uh, on the country. An estimated 21 million Americans would lose health insurance nationwide if the law is struck down. And protections for 54 million people with pre-existing conditions could also be eliminated. It's sort of like a giant mouse. And it just goes up against my chest. It's a scary prospect for Gene Faltus of New Hampshire, who says his medical chart reads like a horror story of conditions that an insurer could potentially deny. Cancer, cardiac conditions, pulmonary dysfunction, diabetes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, I would have been excluded. There was no way prior to the ACA that I could have gotten, um, you know, any sort of insurance if I was uh, suddenly in the position of needing it through lack of employment. President Trump and congressional Republicans have insisted there's no need to panic. We'll always protect people with pre-existing. So I'd like to terminate Obamacare, come up with a brand new beautiful health care. There are certainly multiple ways to protect people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, what you can't do is just kind of wave a magic wand and, uh, and hope it happens. So we're getting Andrew's day started here with his morning feed. The uncertainty has Christine Callahan of Ohio deeply anxious. Her 13-year-old son, Andrew, who has an undiagnosed genetic condition, requires $7,000 a month in medical care. On the health care insurance, we're a loss leader. But is it fair to say, like, we don't deserve it because we have a need? Callahan worries ending Obamacare would mean a return to the time when insurance companies could cap payouts if you get sick. I feel like we're going to come to a point if we're back to those days of what is the quality of this care that we can afford without spending everything we have. I mean, it's a balance of what do we do for our daughter as far as saving for college. I think it's that coming to the decision of our finances versus his care. I always have to remind myself to breathe. Also on edge, more than 14.8 million low-income Americans who gained health coverage under Obamacare's expansion of Medicaid. Every day is a struggle to survive, right? Because we don't get enough money to come in, right? And also the benefits, right? Um, as well, like health care benefits. 23-year-old Lisa Nishimura says without Medicaid, she couldn't afford the treatment she needs for severe chronic depression and PTSD. The ACA requires insurers to treat those conditions equally with others. Mental health um, you know, is just as important as physical health, and it can be the deciding factor between life and death. 
Um, and you know, without ACA, without Medicaid, you know, I don't. I don't know how I would have paid those hospital costs. A majority of American voters in the 2020 election said they want the Supreme Court to uphold Obamacare. Just 43 percent said they'd like it overturned. Republicans tried and failed dozens of times since 2010 to repeal and replace the health law. But now polls show its benefits are as popular as ever, with some Republican opponents even conceding the law should be kept but fixed. What needs to be done to fix it? right now. The, the thing the ACA didn't do was deal with the underlying cost of health care, which drives insurance premiums up. Uh, and that has really hit middle class people hard. Uh, so I think some way of helping middle class people who have trouble affording health care uh, would be an important uh, improvement to the ACA. The new Congress and new president could soon move to take on that challenge. But first, supporters of Obamacare say the law needs to survive the latest test, the Supreme Court. I, I think I'm enough of a realist. What I'm optimistic about is that we will find a way around it. I'm optimistic that there will be such an outcry from the country uh, demanding it. People have gotten used to uh, the ACA. At the center of the Supreme Court case is the individual mandate, which requires all Americans to have health insurance. It was upheld by the court back in 2012 as a tax. But after the penalty was eliminated by Republicans after Trump took office, two lower federal courts have said the mandate is now simply an unconstitutional government order. One of the key questions for the justices, can the mandate be severed from the rest of the law, keeping the balance of Obamacare? It'll be a major test for new justices. Justice Amy Coney Barrett, who's been critical of Obamacare, but much less clear in her views of severability. Lindsay? Devin, thanks so much. And when we come back, Kamala Harris is already has a lot of firsts behind her name. Now she has made history again. Tomorrow morning, on the day before the CMA Awards, wake up from Nashville with... Hey, I'm Darius Rucker. Good morning, America. Yes, it's Darius performing for you. This is going to be so good. Tomorrow, only on Good Morning America, sponsored by Walmart. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored, winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times. Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start here, free, on Apple Podcasts. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? To figure out what's really out there. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. The night before the CMA Awards. Finish the sentence. Country music in 2020 is... Alive and well. Creative. Resilient. Raw. Emotional. Oh, yeah. The ABC special with Robin Roberts, Tuesday night on ABC. And finally tonight, for the first time in American history, a woman will be a heartbeat away from the presidency. And not just any woman, a woman of color. This is nothing new for Kamala Harris. For most of her adult life, when barriers were broken, she was often to blame. Throughout her life, barriers have been broken all around her, from the DA's office to the Senate, and now the White House. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris now set to assume the second highest office in the land. While I may be the first woman in this office, I will not be the last. The first black and Indian American to run and be elected as vice president. Every little girl watching tonight sees that this is a country of possibilities. This moment has come full circle for Harris, shattering a glass ceiling for race and gender. Her sorority sisters at Howard University's Alpha Kappa Alpha, the oldest historically black sorority, taking it all in. Ultimately, the final numbers show 
you know, what direction we want to go in. And so that is what makes me excited. You know, those, so with the tears I ultimately shed will be tears of joy. In California, where she was elected the state's top prosecutor, she was the first woman and first black woman to hold that office as well. And then in 2016, the first black American to represent California in the Senate. I am so proud to represent this beautiful, diverse state. It was there her combative style took center stage, coming to national attention at the Senate hearing for Judge Brett Kavanaugh on his alleged sexual misconduct. Can you think of any laws that give government the power to make decisions about uh, the male body? I'm happy to answer a uh, more specific question. Male versus female. There are um, medical procedures. Later, showcasing her abilities in a fiery debate with Vice President Pence. That is he only bill. cutting, is he only going to repeal part of the Trump tax cuts? If you don't mind letting me finish, we can Please. then have a conversation, okay? Please. Okay. The pandemic sidelined what would have been her chance to introduce herself to voters. Harris took to the road in the waning days of the campaign, hitting up cities in crucial states that dominated headlines leading up to their apparent victory Saturday night. Because we all know from the time the polls open tomorrow morning until they close, every minute counts. So we cannot let up because it ain't over till it's over. Her latest win now puts her on the global stage. What she's accomplished has made her an inspiration for little girls, women, and people of color everywhere. That's very empowering and eye-opening, knowing that you could potentially do everything that you want to do just because you have an example set for you. I keep thinking about that 25-year-old Indian woman, all of five feet tall, who gave birth to me at Kaiser Hospital in Oakland, California. On that day, she probably could have never imagined that I would be standing before you now. Some of her former opponents now showing their support. Senator Elizabeth Warren tweeting, throughout her career, she has been unafraid and an inspiration to millions of women who see themselves in her. Now is when the real work begins. The hard work, the necessary work, the good work, the essential work to save lives and beat this epidemic. But while Harris has attempted to appear more progressive... In many cities in America, over one-third of their city budget goes to police. So we have to have this conversation. What are we doing? During the primary, Harris was pressed on a record with policing during her time as a prosecutor. I'm deeply concerned about this record. I did the work of significantly reforming the criminal justice system of a state of 40 million people, which became a national model for the work that needs to be done. And I am proud of that work. In a time when the relationship between people of color and law enforcement is under extreme scrutiny. Good Morning America's Robin Roberts spoke with Biden and Harris just after their nomination. There's also been a, a national conversation about policing. Mm -hmm. And you know the name that you have, Kamala, top cop. And the book that you wrote 10 years ago, Smart on Crime, where you concluded by saying that you wanted to see more police on the street. Do you still feel that way? Listen, I think that there is no question. First of all, when I wrote that book, Black Lives Matter did not exist. And I give full credit to the brilliance of that movement in terms of what it has done to advance a conversation that needed to happen a long time ago. Harris butted heads with her running mate last year when she sought the Democratic nomination for president. Go easy on me, kid. She criticized her future running mate after he touted his record of bipartisanship. It is personal, and I was actually very, it was hurtful. To hear you talk about the reputations of two United States senators who built their reputations and career on the segregation of race in this country. President-elect Biden will be 78 years old when he's inaugurated, the oldest president in the history of the country by eight years, taking the title from outgoing President Donald Trump. Look, I view myself as a bridge not as anything else. There's an entire generation of leaders you saw stand behind me. They are the future of this country. A future that will fall to young people, women, and people of color across the country. Be president. No, you could be president, but not right now. You have to be over the age of 35.
That hope to one day take center stage and take up that mantle that Harris first bore. And when our very democracy was on the ballot in this election, with the very soul of America at stake, and the world watching, you ushered in a new day for America. And as she says, she may be the first, but will not be the last. Before we go tonight, our image of the day, the flowers and tributes continue to pour in for Jeopardy host Alex Trebek. So many remembering the man who gave us a daily pop quiz around dinner time. He will be deeply missed. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us, and good night.